Hey, good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. Here are the stories we're watching tonight, starting with a day in court for the person Donald Trump allegedly told to delete security footage. That is Carlos D. Oliveira, Donald Trump's co-defendant in the classified records case who was supposed to be arraigned today, but he wasn't because he didn't have the right kind of lawyer. We're going to break down what's going on there. Plus, an American nurse and her young daughter had been kidnapped in Haiti, but with gangs ruling most of the country there and a government with basically no elected officials, who does the U.S. talk to to try to get them back? because it's a, an ongoing law enforcement investigation, uh, there's not any more detail I can offer. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sits down for a one-on-one -on -one interview with NBC News a week after pushing his controversial new law to weaken Israel's Supreme Court through parliament. Israel's president has actually warned of the danger of civil war. Was it worth it? There won't be civil war, I guarantee you that. And tonight, we are keeping an eye on all the legal problems following former President Donald Trump right now. Cases spanning from Washington, D.C. to Georgia to Florida. And starting with Florida, where Mar-a-Lago property manager Carlos de Oliveira appeared in court today. Now, this is our first time seeing him, the third defendant in the federal classified documents case. He's accused of making false statements, obstructing justice, and destroying evidence, which in this case is security camera footage from Mar-a-Lago. And when it came time for him to enter a plea, he didn't because he didn't have a local lawyer. We're going to get to that in just a second. But De Oliveira's alleged role in all of this is in that new superseding indictment, which also hit Trump with three new charges in this case, all of it happening in Florida, while all eyes are also on Washington, where special counsel Jack Smith can drop a new third indictment for Donald Trump any day now. And that is news coming from President or former President Donald Trump himself saying that an indictment from deranged Jack Smith will be coming any day now on his Truth Social site. This one about Trump's role in the 2020 election interference and subsequently January 6th. And finally, new developments over in Georgia as well. A judge denied yet another attempt by Trump's team there to get him out of the Fullerton County investigation, which is focusing on efforts to overturn the 2020 election results in the state. The DA now saying her office is ready to announce whether they're going to charge Trump or not as soon as September 1st. So a lot to break down there. NBC's Garrett Hake, who covers the Trump campaign, joins us now. Let's start in Florida. Uh, what happened with Carlos de Oliveira's uh, appearance? He didn't have the, the right kind of lawyer? Yeah, that's right. We saw this when Trump was there, too, this idea that you need a lawyer who's barred in the Southern District to be able to represent you down there. So it was a relatively short appearance for De Oliveira. He didn't enter a plea. He was released on a $100,000 signature bond, basically saying that he'll be there for the next appearance. Not a lot of headlines out of this, but we're seeing the man for the first time. And the counsel that he was there with is somebody who's kind of in that Trump orbit, suggesting that he's probably going to be continuing to defend his boss rather than testifying against him whenever this case really gets up and running, got it. And when it comes to an indictment to any day now, any truth to the timing on that truth social post so far? Look, I think Donald Trump's best guess on this is a little bit better educated than ours, but not a lot. He's operating on a lot of the same facts that we are. He got a target letter nearly two weeks ago now. That's unusual and almost always means you're going to be indicted. And before the classified documents news kind of blew everything out of the water on Thursday, remember, his attorneys were in D.C. meeting with the special counsel's team on Thursday, trying to talk them out of indicting him in that case, on the election case. Uh, and we didn't hear anything to the effect of them being successful. We know they had that meeting. We know they tried. They tried to have a similar meeting on the classified documents case. It didn't work there either. All the all the signs point to an indictment coming sooner rather than later. But it's kind of just like playing a Ouija board or something like that. Gotti, we're all just making our best guess here. And I think that's what Trump's doing, too. Uh, finally, in Georgia, is there any coordination there between special counsel Jack Smith, considering both investigations are focusing on the 2020 election? 
Well, Smith's not talking, but Willis says no, the DA down there. She says there's never been any coordination between her and Smith. In fact, she, uh, in an interview down there, said she doesn't know that she'd be able to pick Smith out of a lineup and that she's pretty sure he wouldn't be able to pronounce her last name correctly. No coordination, but a lot of overlap on the investigation, at least as it's had to do with Georgia. And, Gotti, there could be significant overlap. If there's not an indictment here in Washington until next week, we could run into a situation where the former president gets indicted twice in the same week in two different jurisdictions, may even have trouble scheduling an arraignment. I mean, these things are really coming to a head at the same time. Definitely looking like a busy month ahead. Gary Hake, thanks so much. And let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, let's start with Carlos de Oliveira. He's a person who, whom Trump allegedly directed to delete security footage from. Uh, so today he shows up without a local lawyer, but he did have someone with him. Uh, what can we guess based on how today went down? This is the kind of thing that happens fairly often. If a defendant is indicted, the arraignment is usually held within days. And oftentimes, they'll get the public defender, and the public defender will handle the arraignment, and that probably won't even be the same PD that handles the trial, uh, especially in state court. This happens all the time. In fact, in state court, if a defendant doesn't have a lawyer, a judge will literally just grab a warm body of a lawyer just waiting around sometimes. It's really not what they should do, but... Believe me, it happens. Maybe not so much in federal court. But the point is this. If the arraignment happens just days after the indictment, most uh, defendants simply can't put together the funds to hire a criminal defense attorney because we criminal defense attorneys usually require everything up front uh, for obvious reasons that you don't want to chase your fee after a client is convicted or in prison. So, I mean, it's common for this kind of thing to happen for a defendant not to have a lawyer, uh, but the judge will not give a continuance indefinitely. Judges will like I said, in state court sometimes, just throw any lawyer in there for the arraignment, even though that's probably not the way it should go down. Garrett mentioned something about having someone, possibly a lawyer from Trump's orbit, uh, that was uh, possibly there. This is going to be a guy that the feds are definitely going to be trying to flip. Does it look like he may be working with uh, some legal counsel that is affiliated with the former president? Yeah, I'm not so sure that uh, I wouldn't assume that the feds want this co-defendant to flip. In a sense, the fact that they indicted them shows that whether he flips or not, they believe they have enough to find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, would they be interested in talking to him? Yeah, sure. But you have to understand, the federal government, pro federal prosecutors negotiate from a position of power. They never negotiate from a position of weakness. So in other words, if De Oliveira were to come to them through his attorney and say, all right, I'm thinking about talking to you guys, but you better impress me. I think the government would just say, we don't have to impress anybody. I mean, you can just go to trial or you can talk to us. You can do whatever you want. I mean, the government is in the position of power here in any negotiations. They don't need De Oliveira. They would probably take him if you wanted to come in. Uh, meanwhile, we're seeing this simultaneous movement in Georgia and Washington. Uh, which of those two stands out to you? What, what's the stronger case here? It's always the federal case. Always, uh, if you're going to bet, and that's you know that's really all we're talking about as defense attorneys and prosecutors. We deal in odds. We deal in probabilities. I mean, that's the only thing we can do because we can't tell the future. And if you want to play probabilities, if you're in federal court, the odds are you're getting convicted. Uh, if you're in state court, you have a fighting chance. Doesn't mean state courts or, or state prosecutors are inferior. It means they handle a lot more cases. It means they have a lot more on their plate, and they don't have the resources of the federal government. So. Uh, look, I mean, if, I'm, if you're playing the odds, it's always been more serious for Trump to be indicted in federal court. The New York indictment, the state indictment, doesn't impress me much. I don't know anything about what George is going to do. We're assuming Trump's going to be indicted. Maybe he won't. Uh, maybe Fannie, Fannie Willis, who's been very deliberate and very careful, maybe she'll decide, you know what, there are other people that were responsible. I don't know that I can get the big guy, the big fish, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. So maybe I'll just indict some other people in his orbit. Playing the odds is a little bit better than playing uh, Garrett's Ouija board. Danny Savalos, thanks so much. And it is life in prison for the alleged doomsday mob, Lori Vallow Daybell, the Idaho mom who was convicted in May for killing her two children, who she said were possessed by evil spirits. She was the mother who killed two of her kids, saying that they were zombies, and today was sentenced to several life sentences without the possibility of parole. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has a story. Miguel? I do not fear death, but I look forward to it. 
Reading from notes moments before a judge ordered her to spend the rest of her life behind bars, Lori Vallow Daybell, the Idaho mother convicted of killing her two children and conspiring to murder her husband's former wife, broke her silence and remained defiant. No one was murdered in this case. Accidental deaths happen. Suicides happen. Fatal side effects from medications happen. I know for a fact that my children are happy and busy in the spirit world. With Vallow Daybell claiming she has spoken to the victims in the afterlife, the tragic and bizarre case led to sensational headlines. Dubbed the Doomsday Cult Mom, Vallow Daybell claimed her children were zombies and she was a goddess sent to usher in the biblical apocalypse. The mutilated bodies of 7-year-old JJ and 16-year-old Tylee were found on the property of her new husband, Chad Daybell, a self-published author who wrote about Doomsday and whose former wife he is also accused of killing. I have always mourned the loss of my loved ones, and I have lost many in this mortal world. As the judge admonished Vallow Daybell for showing no remorse, prosecutors say the motive was money, arguing the mother killed her children to collect benefit checks. The crime scene was a horrific thing to have to review. Despite the heinous crime, Vallow Daybell's attorney pleaded for mercy, but family members say she deserves none. Yeah, we're done, Lori. We are done with Lori. She is no more to us. Chad Daybell, who has pleaded not guilty, faces similar charges his wife Lori was convicted of. His trial on murder and conspiracy to commit murder is scheduled to get underway next year. He, too, faces life in prison. Back to you. Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. The search is on for a driver who appears to have intentionally hit six migrant workers at a Walmart in North Carolina. This is surveillance video from the store's parking lot that shows a black SUV pulling out of a parking spot, inching along, then speeding up, plowing right through those trees where they hit those six people before speeding off. All six of the victims have been released from the hospital. And in San Francisco, prosecutors presented evidence today against a tech consultant charged with the murder and the stabbing death of Cash App founder Bob Lee. The evidence against Nima Momini includes DNA from a bloody knife and video footage, and a judge will ultimately decide whether there's enough evidence for the case to go to trial. Momini has pled not guilty. And on Capitol Hill, a former business partner of Hunter Biden testified behind closed doors as part of the Republican-led investigation into Hunter Biden's financial dealings. Now, Devin Archer said Hunter would put calls with his dad on speakerphone to impress clients, but said that President Biden was never directly involved in business dealings. And wildfires are burning through California and Nevada right now. One of those fires is called the York Fire in the Mojave Desert. It's reached 77,000 acres and is not contained at all. It is officially the largest wildfire of the season in California. And Euphoria actor Angus Cloud has died. In a statement, his family said he struggled with the loss of his dad, who was buried just last week. His family also said they hope his death will remind others that they're not alone. He was 25. And the search is on for an American nurse and her daughter who were kidnapped in Haiti. Alex Dorsonville was working for a Christian nonprofit when she and her daughter were taken near the capital city of Port-au-Prince on Thursday. That is the same day that the U.S. State Department ordered some government employees to leave the country because of growing unrest there. Joining us now is NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren from Dorsonville's home uh, town in New Hampshire. Kristen, what do we know right now about the kidnap? Right, Gotti. Well, you know, details are scarce at this point, both the organization that she was working for and the State Department, you know, saying this is an ongoing investigation and nobody wants to jeopardize uh, her safety and the safety of her young daughter. So they're not releasing many details. What we do know is about the deteriorating situation uh, in Haiti. I spoke with an expert who spent most of his State Department career in Haiti and said at this point, these skyrocketing kidnappings are really all about money and that gangs have taken in control of many places in that country and that we're seeing a lot of these kidnappings. And so just a dangerous situation. The State Department has issued that level four alert urging uh, Americans to leave the country, Gotti. 
I mean, Kristen, we're seeing so many of these loving images of her and with her work uh, with that Christian organization. Can you tell us a little bit more about Alex? What do we know about her? Right. So Alex is from New Hampshire here, but in her own words, she said Haiti is really her home at this point. She loves the country. Uh, according to a new statement that we just got within the last few hours uh, from that organization that she was working for, her husband is the one who founded it. it. It described how she first went to Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, and she just fell in love with the place and the people, and she kept going back when she became a nurse. She was funding her own trips there. Ultimately, she ended up working for for El Roy uh, in 2020, working at a school. She loved to help the kids there. She married the founder of the organization. They had a child together. And so really everybody just saying they're praying for her safe return at this point. And the organization saying it's doing what it, it can, working with its partners in Haiti to ensure her safe release. And talking about some of those partners, I mean, Haiti at this point is still a, a somewhat of a failed state, right? Who does the United States interface with when it comes to trying to get her back? Well, that's the question there. I mean, with gangs in control of 80 percent of the cities in Haiti, it's really unclear, you know, who's in charge and working with the government may not be sufficient when it really is the gangs that are in charge in many of these places. And so the State Department uh, presumably is working back channels as well, trying to get in touch with the right people who have contacts uh, in these gangs who may have been responsible uh, for this reported kidnapping. But you know, everybody just at this point trying to work, but also trying to work behind the scenes, saying that a lot of media coverage uh, and us knowing any details and those being widespread could be dangerous for this woman and her daughter. And so, you know, it's a dangerous situation and everybody doing uh, at this point the best that they can to get them home safely. Gotti. Well, we're praying for their return. Kristen Dahlgren, thanks so much. And in the African nation of Niger, chaos continues. Just yesterday, pro-coup protesters attacked the French embassy there as thousands took to the streets to support the military junta. And check this out. If you look closely, you'll see a bunch of Russian flags. It is the, those blue and white and red flags from top to bottom. Crowds screaming, long live Putin and down with France. All this as Niger's ousted president meets with the leader of Chad. NBC's Courtney Kuby has more. Tonight, the first glimpse of Niger's democratically elected president, Mohamed Bazoum. Not seen since last week after a coup. Bazoum smiling, meeting with the leader of Chad, who's now trying to mediate in Niger after several West African countries called on the coup leaders to give up power, warning them to release President Bazoum in the next week or face possible military action. Such measures may include the use of force. Over the weekend, thousands took to the streets of the capital here, mostly peaceful, supporting the coup. Some waving Russian flags chanting, long live Russia. <laughs> Though violence erupted outside the French embassy, <laughs> crowds burning a door and throwing rocks at windows, chased off by tear gas before they could breach the outer walls. Tonight, the coup leaders have not responded to the ultimatum, vowing to defend Niger from aggression, accusing France of planning a military intervention. Both France and the U.S. have military bases here in Niger. Adding to the tensions, should the U.S. designate this as a coup, more than $400 million in U.S. aid and military training would immediately be at risk. Any questions? Eroding years of U.S.-Nigerian partnership, training to combat terror groups here. Late Monday, Bazoom's party saying 130 of its members were arrested by the junta, including four members of Bazoom's ousted cabinet. Courtney Kuby, thanks so much. Stay safe out there. And a deep social divide is opening up in Israel after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pay, uh, passed a new law that limits the power of the Supreme Court there. And across the country, tens of thousands of people are taken to the streets to protest the judicial overhaul. They've been at it for 30 weeks now. And despite all of that, in an exclusive interview with NBC News, Netanyahu claims the new law is necessary for Israel to move forward. NBC's Raf Sanchez has more. 
We sat down with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today, one week after tens of thousands of Israelis flooded onto the streets here in Jerusalem and other cities, trying to stop the Prime Minister's controversial legislation to weaken Israel's Supreme Court. The protests weren't enough. That new law went through. Today, in a wide-ranging interview, we asked the Prime Minister about the fallout from that legislation, about the impact it's having on Israel's military, and about the state of his relationship with President Biden. Prime Minister, you successfully passed the first part of your legislation, but only after six months of mass protests that have left this country so divided, Israel's president has actually warned of the danger of civil war. Was it worth it? There won't be civil war, I guarantee you that. Uh, but I think that correcting the imbalance in Israel's democracy, where the uh, judiciary is basically arrogated to itself, nearly all the powers of the executive branch and the legislature, I think, yes, it is important to do it. Uh, I think when the dust settles, people will see that Israel's democracy has been strengthened and not weakened. The Israeli military said to me, if reservists do not show up for reserve duty in the long term, there will be damage to the military's readiness. What do you say to Israelis who are worried that the way you've passed this legislation is so divisive, it may actually impact national security? Well, first of all, it wasn't divisive. I mean, I've waited for seven months, as you yourself say, seven months to have basically an agreement. I certainly don't. I think it was important to pass this particular uh, clause that we did in order to make clear that the government does not uh, abide by the dictates of former generals or uh, or people in the, in the military or in the military reserves. How optimistic are you that there could be a peace deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia during President Biden's current term? Now we have an opportunity to perhaps uh, begin to end the Arab-Israeli conflict with peace with Saudi Arabia, open up to a peace between the Jewish people and the Muslim world. So I think it's, it's uh, a huge thing. Now, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the negotiations of how to achieve it, uh, if it was that easy, it would have been done. But I'm, uh, I appreciate the fact that the uh, administration is uh, putting time and effort in this, as am I. And it's really, uh, uh, of course, up to Saudi Arabia and all of us to see if we can come to a, uh, a middle ground. As far as uh, what to do with the Palestinians, I've, I'll tell you what my position has been. I always said that with the Palestinians, they should have all the powers to govern themselves, or rather, all the uh, ability to govern themselves and none of the powers to threaten Israel. And that hasn't changed. That's my view. A number of human rights organizations, both American and Israeli, and a growing number of Democratic members of Congress, say that the situation in the West Bank, where the Palestinians live with varying degrees of autonomy, depending on where they live, mm -hmm. but ultimately live under Israeli control without a vote in Israel's government, they say that situation is apartheid. What do you say to that? I think it's hogwash. I mean, the whole idea of, is of ethnic cleansing is what they're talking about. And this interview, just about a week after the 73-year-old prime minister was fitted with a pacemaker after suffering from an irregular heartbeat, he seemed vigorous, he seemed in good health, and I can tell you he gave absolutely no indication of backing down on any front at this turbulent moment for both his leadership and for his country. Back to you. Fascinating interview. Raf Sanchez, thanks so much. And coming up, a scene straight out of Jaws. A bull shark launches into a fishing boat again and again like a freaking torpedo off the coast of Florida. But first, you got to see this. You are looking at a burnt semi-truck that caught fire early this morning in Placer County, California. But this isn't just any semi-truck. This one was carrying 40,000 pounds of chocolate. That's right. Those are big chunks of chocolate you're seeing melting on the side of the highway. Luckily, no one was hurt, and firefighters were able to contain the fire to the trailer. And no firefighters are not going to be grabbing some marshmallows and graham crackers because that would be inappropriate. Plus, they already had some hot chocolate. We'll be right back. Hey there, welcome back. Let's get you caught up in 30 seconds. The woman convicted of killing her two kids, saying that they were zombies, will be spending the rest of her life in prison. She was handed down several life sentences today. Lori Vallow Daybell will also not be eligible for parole. And an American nurse and her child were kidnapped in Haiti. It happened on the same day that the U.S. State Department told non-emergency government employees to leave that country because of the instability. 
And Paul Rubens, the man who brought the character Pee Wee Herman to life, has died after a long battle with cancer. He was 70 years old. They were called the Gilgo Four, the bodies of four women found killed and wrapped in burlap and left on a beach within days of each other back in 2010. And now a massive break in the case has led to a Manhattan architect who's been charged in the murders. And the suspected serial killer's estranged wife is now breaking her silence about that case. NBC's Stephanie Gosk has more. When police arrested Rex Hearman on a Manhattan street corner just over two weeks ago, the wife of the alleged serial killer was at the couple's home, where she lives with her two adult children. According to Asa Ellerup's attorney, who says the family is enduring a profound and indescribable catastrophe. It's been a very tumultuous time for them. Life has been thrown upside down in the past few weeks. This was all brought on them all of a sudden out of nowhere. Ellerup filed for divorce and is now asking for privacy for her children, and her neighbors. They deserve to live peacefully, she writes. I am pleading with you all to give us space so that we may regain some normalcy in our neighborhood. In the days following the arrest, investigators poured through the family's Long Island home, removing truckloads of possible evidence, including, the DA says, nearly 300 guns. The small single-story house is just miles from where the bodies were discovered on Gilgo Beach over a decade ago. Hureman is charged with killing three young women and is the main suspect in the disappearance of a fourth. The 59-year-old pleaded not guilty and has been held without bail, his attorney it? not responding to NBC News' request for comment. The prosecutor says it will take time to sift through new evidence, including what was found in two storage units nearby. We have obtained a massive amount of, of uh, material. Rex Herman will be back in court tomorrow on Long Island. It will be brief. The prosecutor says among the topics being discussed is whether there should be a formal bail hearing. NBC Stephanie Gosk, thanks so much. And July is still on track to be the hottest month ever. These deadly summer heat waves scorching the country just don't seem to end. And it is making the simplest of outdoor activities very dangerous. At least eight kids were taken to the hospital this weekend for heat exposure in Savannah, Georgia. That's where families were lined up for free school supplies and food when people started to pass out because of the heat. A lot of people got exactly what they came for. They got the shoes, they got the uniforms, and they got the book bags. They were fed, and, you know, it was just at one point where people started actually um, passing out and what have you. And this isn't just dangerous, it's expensive. A gallon of regular today costs an average of around $3.76. That's about 16 cents higher than it was a week ago, and drivers are starting to feel the pressure. Yes, I've noticed the prices dramatically changing in the last few weeks. How does that make you feel? Resigned. In what way? I, I need gas. Um, I can choose whether or not how much I'm going to travel, but it's necessary for me to travel, and I don't know of any alternative. So I'm unhappy. Uh, the reason for that, oil refineries can't work at full capacity in heat waves. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson has more from Los Angeles. Yeah, Gotti, I don't want to say this is the worst we've ever seen, right? I mean, I think everybody remembers summer of last year, but if you look over my left shoulder, things aren't great. Uh, gas is definitely starting to spike really around the country, but especially, of course, right here in the great state of California. Uh, it's for a number of reasons. If you were to, like, open up a pie chart, right, there are more extenuating factors than just maybe, let's say, the heat. But I think it's important to talk about this year. However, you have to also look at the production of crude oil around the world, really. The Saudis uh, have limited production, so that makes the prices here spike a little bit more. There's also just market demands. But there is also the heat wave, which is like now this double whammy, right? I'm standing out in it right now. It's hot everywhere, but that's having an impact, sort of a knock-on impact, on gas prices because a lot of these refineries are doing what I'm doing, which is standing out in it, except these are very old creaky machines that are in much hotter places than I'm standing right now. We're talking about, like, the Gulf. We're talking about Texas. We're talking about Louisiana, parts of the West Coast, where you have these big refineries. And what they do is take that crude oil, turn it into usable materials, like the gasoline that we pump into their cars. Because it's so hot, though, they're sustaining multiple 100-degree days. They can't handle operating at full capacity. So we're limiting the amount of production that is going through those refineries, which means, of course, 
price of gas goes up again. That's the situation we're in. All those factors are leading to the spike. We spoke to experts. They're saying maybe another 7 to 10 cents before this is all said and done. So we could be looking at an actual average, something like 385 before September. September is, again, when sort of the height of the driving season kind of dips a little bit. So hopefully the prices will dip a little bit. For, but for now, it is, uh, as we always say, pain at the pump. The only sort of recommendations, check your apps, try to find the best price, you know, uh, check your tire pressure, use cruise control, go easy on the AAC. All of these things can help, but it's sort of unavoidable, and you just kind of have to wait it out. Got it? Wait. Wait it out. NBC, Steve Patterson, thanks so much. Now, you know that scene in Jaws where Jaws gets super mad and then just starts chomping down on the boat and then attacks again and again, and then they have to blow him up by shooting a bunch of scuba tanks? That's kind of what happened off the coast of Florida, except for this time, the boat didn't sink and there was no big explosion and the shark was just a little bit smaller and everyone lived to tell the tale. Oh, there was also drone video of all of it. It is a crazy story. Check this out. This stunning scene happening off the coast of South Florida, a bull shark repeatedly launching itself at a fisherman's boat. And all of a sudden, something switched in the shark's brain, and he just went into full attack mode. Video producer and fishing guide Josh Jorgensen had been following a school of fish with his drone when he caught the shark battering his friend's boat. And he just went completely nuts and just started attacking the engines and just ripping them to pieces. Fishing boat captain Carl Torreson said he couldn't believe how much damage the shark caused. I didn't think a shark could actually shake the boat like that. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is like a ride from Universal Studios. Ah! In May, a similar incident captured Tiger off shark. the coast of Oahu. Tiger shark rammed me. Kayak fisherman Scott Haraguchi rammed by a 10 to 12 foot tiger shark. It's miraculous that I didn't get knocked over. While in Florida, the shark bite capital of the nation, a recent string of attacks leading to alerts and beach closures. Looks like we got a hammerhead shark. A 12 year old girl bitten on the leg while swimming at Cocoa Beach. It hurts like incredibly bad. It was really, really painful, and I just wasn't expecting it. But unprovoked shark attacks are rare, and fatalities even more so. Researchers at Cal State Long Beach spent two years filming California beaches where great whites hang out and learn they come close to swimmers and surfers almost daily without humans even knowing. I think most people's conception of what a shark, a white shark is, is that if you see it in the water, it's going to bite you. And I think one of the things our study showed is that's simply not true. Even bull sharks, known to be more aggressive, don't usually charge like this. When they do, it can look like something out of the movies. I know this sounds insane, but that scene in Jaws where it jumps on the back of the boat, that is totally possible. Yikes. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. What are the chances of getting attacked by a shark again? They are still like one in 3.75 million. So you'll probably be fine. When we come back, drone strikes in Moscow. They just hit hours before the start of a parade Vladimir Putin was attending. We're going to take a look at how the war is now extending beyond the borders of Ukraine. But before the break, take a look at this. Two people were on a boat, burning boat in Michigan, and luckily, some good Samaritans on another boat nearby made sure they got off and fast. It's too late. Get off the boat. Get off the boat. It's going to blow. You guys want to jump out right jump now? Jump out right now! Wow, just in the nick of time. We'll be right back. Hey there, let's take a quick look around the world in 80 seconds. The Islamic State has claimed responsibility for a deadly suicide attack in Pakistan that killed 54 people and hurt more than 100. It happened yesterday on the Afghanistan border. The bombing targeted a rally of pro-Taliban cleric. And in China, at least two people have died due to heavy rain and flooding. The intense rain triggered landslides, swept away cars, and forced officials to close tourist spots in Beijing. At least 5,000 people were also evacuated from their homes, and that rain is expected to last until Tuesday. In Colombia, police arrested the president's son this weekend. They were investigating his role in a high-profile money laundering scheme. He apparently took money from convicted drug dealers during last year's presidential campaign. And Colombia's president, Gustavo Petro, says he will not interfere with the investigation. 
And a military-led government will now rule Myanmar for the least uh, another six months there. Today, it extended a state of emergency it imposed when the army seized power over two years ago. So-called security forces have killed nearly 4,000 people since Myanmar's military takeover. And after a series of drone attacks in Moscow this weekend, President Vladimir Zelensky released a video saying the war is returning to Russia, though he did not explicitly take responsibility for the attacks. NBC chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has more. The drones exploded in the heart of Moscow's financial district on Sunday morning around 4 a.m. Russian officials say at least three drones were involved and blamed Ukraine. Russians can no longer turn a blind eye to this war now that it's coming home. Although Ukraine didn't take responsibility, President Zelensky gave what seemed to be the most direct admission of cross-border attacks into Russia yet and suggested a new chapter is beginning. Ukraine is getting stronger. Gradually, the war is returning to Russian territory, its symbolic centers and military bases. And this is an inevitable, natural and absolutely fair process, he said. The war continues to be a disaster for Russia. 523 days in, Russia seems no closer to victory than when it first invaded. The Russian army is so short of troops, it had to raise the age limit for conscripts. But you wouldn't know it listening to President Putin, who was busy celebrating Navy Day this weekend. In the name of Russia, our sailors are giving all their strength, showing true heroism and fighting valiantly, as our great ancestors did, he said. Small, explosive drones have been central to the war from the start and are now exposing Moscow's vulnerability. In May, the Kremlin itself was attacked by drones. Ukraine denied involvement at the time. But attacks are becoming more frequent. This was the fourth drone attack in or around Moscow this month. And Ukraine no longer seems concerned about hiding it. In addition to attacks inside Russia, Russian defense officials accuse Ukraine of carrying out drone attacks against the occupied Crimean Peninsula, including one which Russia says it stopped, involving a swarm of 25 drones. NBC's Richard Engel, thanks so much. And the stakes are high for the U.S. women's national soccer team. They're just hours away from their most critical match yet at the Women's World Cup, where they've got to beat Portugal. But for star player Megan Rapino, who is playing her final World Cup, the pressure is on to win this match, and it's just part of the game. Take a listen. This is what it means. This is the pressure of being... Um the number one team in a World Cup, but this is just the pressure in general being at the World Cup. Like, this moment is going to come no matter what. And that's what the tournament is now. Every single game from here on out is that pressure moment, and, like, that's the best part of being at the World Cup. NBC's Molly Hunter got a chance to chat with Rapino one-on-one. She joins us from the team's practice ahead of their next big game. Hey there, Molly. We are on the sidelines of practice. Take a look. This is the U.S. team. So cool that we get to actually... Uh, come here, get to check it out before their game days. So tomorrow is their final group stage match against Portugal. That is evening time, our time. That is in the middle of the night on the East Coast. It's really going to test the loyalty, I think, of U.S. fans. 3 a.m. East Coast kickoff. We had the chance to speak with Megan Rapino, though, about this tournament, of course, her final one, about this game. Take a listen. The, the thing that I'm most proud of is that I'm a winner. Um, and it takes a lot to win. It takes a lot of different people in different roles to be able to do that, and every single one of them is important, I think. So I look back at the times I've been a starter, and some of the most important people to me have been players on the bench that haven't even seen the field at all. So I think it takes all of us, and it takes all the energy and everybody doing everything they can to prepare the team to win and ultimately going out there and finishing the job. Now, Megan was so generous about not only the younger players about this team, but also really about accepting her role and how important and vital it is. And when we speak to the younger players and other players on this team, they all acknowledge that all 23 are extremely important to this win. We will be watching that Portugal game very, very closely. I'll send it back to you. Finally tonight, 
Would you live in a neighborhood that was 100% car free? Well, that is the reality right now for a community in Tempe, Arizona. And Trisha Hendricks from our NBC affiliate KPNX has that story. A dream in the making. Check it out. It's a community in Tempe where you won't see any cars. We have zero residential parking. It's called cul-de-sac. We have a completely walkable neighborhood. Aaron Boyd leads government and external affairs. Instead of having a parking lot, we have places for people to shop to enjoy hanging out with each other and a whole load of ways to get around. For founding residents, an e-bike is included in the cost. Unlimited rides on the light rail. We also have electric vehicles for rent. They also have scooters for rent and 15% off all lift rides to and from the site. Here you'll find lots of shade, beautiful artwork, and no asphalt. We find that most of our residents actually don't have a car. And for people who want to try a car-free lifestyle, they can still keep their car. It just has to be parked off-site. This unique approach approach to urban planning prioritizes pedestrian friendly spaces, green areas and sustainable living. Can you imagine living on top of your grocery store? So that is like an amazing perk of living at cul-de-sac. We also have a coffee shop on site, a co-working space, a bike shop, as well as a restaurant and a food truck park with weekly markets. By eliminating cars from the neighborhood, the design team aimed to create a more connected and environmentally conscious community. If you have bike trouble, just take your bike into your local neighborhood mechanic and they're right downstairs. The hope is that this pioneering concept will serve as a model for future developments across the country. By getting rid of your private car, you can actually reduce your carbon footprint by over 50 percent. The community will be opening in phases and by the time the whole project is done, it will include 760 apartments. It looks like it'll be delightful in the winter there. Trisha Hendricks, thanks so much. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.